have said. Now, um, back back in the day, uh, quality engineering was really not even quality engineering. We used to call it quality assurance or quality control because it was one of those steps that uh, that come at the very tail end to just check, uh, do we have bugs or do we have problems that need fixes before you call live? But as you get to see, uh, this is quite changing. Um, uh, things are moving so fast. We are, we are in a world where uh, even customers, whatever they want today, tomorrow they will want a completely different thing uh, because their needs also change with, with, with time. With the advent of the internet, uh, widespread access to uh, computing technology, uh, the customers, they know what they want and they want it very fast. They want it now, they want it yesterday. So I think even our process of uh, doing software development has to reflect that reality. And that's why uh, there is a need for us to consider better ways of doing uh, quality checks without necessarily waiting until the very end uh, to check whether a system is, is, is having problems or not. I'll give you an example. If you're working on a project that is gonna take six months, a big billion dollar, whatever, a project, costly, takes, requires a lot of time, and then you wait until uh, if it's six months, then you wait until month five, and then you do a quality check and you find things are not working. Uh, consider the amount of money that has gone into it, the effort, the time, and it's sometimes even emotional investment because some people, sometimes people get so attached to their project. And then you, go, you tell them, you know what, you guys you have done nothing. Can you go back to the drawing board? So I think um, that, and also with the fact that uh, customer needs are changing quite fast, has necessitated us to adopt new things, new ways of doing things. Uh, so digital transformation is coming in very handy. So you hear uh, people talk a lot about DevOps, uh, people talking a lot about quality engineering as opposed to quality assurance or quality control, and the whole concept of shift left. If you saw the topic, uh, I was trying to you know, relate uh, the concept of quality engineering, uh, DevOps, and the whole idea of shifting left. So why do we do quality? I think this is uh, quite straightforward. If you don't do testing, obviously, um, you're gonna run into problems that could in, in mean uh, cost implications. Um, that means revenue, and that means customer impact. So customer satisfaction is quite important uh, because at the end of the day, customer is a king. If you don't put customer at the center of what you're doing, then you obviously don't know what you're doing. Um, now, I started by saying there is waterfall and then there is agile. So waterfall, as the name suggests, um, maybe if I waterfall simply means things are moving in a in a stepwise kind of direction. Uh, for those who are who have interacted with uh, software design principles, uh, maybe through computer science classes or IT or whatever it is you did in campus. Remember the whole process of getting requirements, designing, implementing, verifying, and maintenance. So verification is where testing comes in. And the example I've given is if you have a project that is running for a long period of time, and then you come at the very tail end and tell people that this is not working, uh, it can have, uh, it can affect people in so many ways. It could also mean a budget has been go has gone into it and you wasted money. It could mean you wasted time. It could mean you wasted your, you have to readjust your timelines, your roadmap is impacted. If you are planning to go live, uh, it's something critical, revenue impact. Uh, customers, of course, maybe you've done your whole um, advert, uh, customer already expecting you to release something big, and then you tell them, uh, guys, we'll have to wait three more months. So all those, uh, it could also even impact your own reputation as a company, because people will be like, you guys don't know what you're doing. So because of this, um, Agile was conceptualized to address this problem so that you don't have to wait until the very end. And Agile, as the name suggests, it means uh, being nimble, being fast, being responsive to change, to demand, to what customer wants. So again, I'll go to an example of uh, say, you're building an app for an e-commerce site. Uh, say Masoko for Safaricom or Jumia, or whatever e-commerce site. So what Agile um, advocates for is that you build an MVP, which is the most um, viable, the minimum viable product, the, the, the most basic 
uh, form of this, this app that a customer can use and give you feedback. Okay, then you release it out there, let the customer give you real feedback based on how they use it, then take those feedback, go back to the, the development. Yes, yeah, so you, get, you get your feedback from the customer, I uh, go back to the drawing board again, maybe add another feature, maybe customer said, um, I needed to add feature X. Okay, you add that feature, you release it, you use it and uh, give you feedback again, come back, implement feature Z uh, until you have something that is robust, that is complicated, that is a big uh, app that we all know. So you start small, but you iteratively build. Um, there are so many agile frameworks that people use out there. Scrum is one of them. They release a product or a feature every two weeks. They save, um, they scan band, they're quite, quite a number. But the whole, post, the whole point is just to make sure that uh, you have that constant feedback loop with your customer. Mm -hmm. And whatever feedback they give you, you put it as part of your development process. And testing has to be, you know, as fast as possible so that you don't wait until the very end. So that's now the new trend as opposed to waterfall. Um, this slide here is just trying to emphasize the same thing that I've said. Um, it's a bit risky if you're doing waterfall because uh, if you cut off a project at the very tail end because there's a bug, uh, that's a, a serious problem. I don't know if you remember which 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 OS they were releasing uh, that Microsoft were releasing, and then um, on the day when the CEO stood on a very big podium and say we are releasing, I don't know whether it was Windows. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it was Vista. Or something. <laughs> And then on that day, something happened. Eh? It was an oops moment for them. Eh? And uh, maybe it might not mean much, but uh, for people who are in the software industry, it's a huge reputational damage for such a big company to not know that such a thing is going to happen to them. So Agile comes and solves those kinds of problems so that you already know uh, the kind of uh, problems you are going into uh, production with. So it's not a, a shocker to the CEO. You can imagine uh, the guys who are building responsible for building such a software, what the CEO did to them. <laughs> yeah, so Agile comes to solve those kind of problems by having those uh, short releases, uh, short sprints, uh, and very, co I mean, constant feedback, mm -hmm. a loop with the people who matter, who are the customers. Okay. So uh, when I talk about shift, shifting left, um, what I mean is that if you remember this, um, what this uh, S -S -S software development life cycle, SDLC, testing should start from as early as ideation. The moment you conceive and say, I want to build such an app or such a web or such a software, that moment you should start testing because um, You, as a, as a QA, you're supposed to challenge the person and say, okay, first, first of all, is it is it viable? Okay, is it making sense? Okay, somebody tells you they want to build a white elephant. You first start challenging it at that point. Somebody tells you they want to build something and the kind of requirements they're giving you. Um, there's this joke that I saw somewhere. Uh, uh, somebody comes to you and say, hey, I want you to help me build a website. Eh? Then, then you ask him, oh, what type of what type of website do you want? So I want something like Facebook. Then you ask him, okay, so what's your budget? Say ten thousand. <laughs> <laughs> this is somebody quite who quite who does not really understand what Facebook is, because he thinks Facebook is just like any other website you can build and with a budget of ten thousand. Because quite frankly, if you are able to build Facebook for ten thousand, you would be a billionaire yourself. Huh? You're not even be in the business of building people websites. So sometimes you really have to challenge somebody from that end before you even write the first line of code or design anything. So at the requirement stage, somebody comes and tells you, you know what? I want uh, a website, or rather a website that is going to be hosted on uh, this kind of servers and is going to be supporting a million people. Okay. Based on the budget, of course, you know, first of all, the infrastructure that is giving you. It's not going to, to support that kind of requirement that it's giving. So at that point, you start challenging those kind of requirements. You are still doing quality engineering. Remember, no code has been written. They're just still telling you what they want to do. 
And from there, you're doing quality assurance or quality engineering. So the whole point of shipping life is to start testing as early as possible. And the whole the reason why you do this is because you can imagine if you don't challenge those kind of requirements and it creeps all the way to the very end. And then at the very tail end, you tell them now, I don't think this is going to, going to work, okay? First of all, they will not respect you because failure. You've been with us the whole journey and now you're telling us it's not going to work. What are you thinking? Did you know what, what, what you're doing, you know? So to avoid those kind of discussion, and it can be quite costly. It can also ruin your uh, reputation as a person who is doing the test. You have those kind of discussions from a very, very early stage. Uh, the, other, the other aspect of shifting left is to make sure that quality is um, engineered in the whole process. Uh, so apart from challenging the requirements and the design and how they're being implemented, you make sure that it's a responsibility of everybody. Traditionally, what has always happened is that we have a whole team that is dedicated to doing quality assurance or quality control. And this happens in most organizations, including mine. But I think the shift we are trying to advocate right now is to make sure that, well, there could be people who are responsible at the end of the day, but also you make sure that uh, quality discussion, quality uh, implementation is something that everybody has to think about. The architect who is designing what needs to be built, he or she needs to make sure that he's designing this with quality in mind. If you want a system that is going to sustain a million people, you have to you know, design very conscious of that kind of requirement. Um, if you are the business analyst who is you know, translating the business language into uh, whatever needs to to be built, you also have to make sure that you're not making uh, requirements that do not make sense or requirements that are going to set you up for failure or something like that. Whoever is implementing as a dev, you don't just build things just because uh, they can pass your unit test and you go on. Uh, you also have to make sure that you're validating things, you're doing all the unit tests before you do your integrations, even before the QA comes in and helps you do the integration yourself as the person who is doing the, the test, um, are you able to uh, to make sure, think that this thing you're building is gonna impact how the customer is going to use the solution and whether they're going to like it or not. So it's quite important. I know some devs can be quite creative for those who have um, had a challenge with some of these devs, even the kind of errors they throw back at you, uh, you, you just laugh at, at someone who is doing the test. Eh? So if you separate dev and, and QA in such a way that it is us versus them, then obviously you're going to find yourself in those kind of problems. Okay. Yeah, so like I was saying, uh, testing has become an increasing activity during the coding and development of software. So it's not something that wait until the very, very end. It's not necessarily a responsibility of testers as we had known them but it's a shared responsibility of everyone who is involved. So even a product manager, even a, a, a PM, a, pro, a project manager, uh, if you have a product owner, depending on how your org structure looks like, uh, even agile coaches, even uh, your engineering managers, even the, the developers, the, dev the DevOps engineers, the business representatives, all of them must have a quality, a responsibility at the end of the day, okay? So, the emphasis again is you're moving from finding defects, which is what quality assurance is all about, to building software that prevents uh, defects from occurring, okay? So it was, they say prevention is better than cure. So if you are able to create structures within your organization and software process that will prevent defects rather than finding defects, it will be less costly, it will save you a lot of time and a lot of back and forth with the developer. So what we try to advocate is that as you are doing your, your developer work or as you're doing your testing or quality engineering work, make sure that your, your work is very closely with, with your developer. When they're running their unit test, uh, of course you're there with them, um, give them a quality perspective. Because sometimes developer will, will do things with a developer mind. So quality may not really be a priority, but when you're there with them and you're talking about quality all the time, uh, obviously, they will start thinking about quality and whatever line of code they're writing uh, will have to. Sometimes, you know, people just care about whether the code is running or not, but that should, should really not be the case. If you have a code that you're having several loops, you know, the way you are querying your DBs or, 
obviously it's going to have performance issues or quality issues. So as a, as a person, a person who is in, in charge of doing quality engineering, when you have your discussion with your driver, that prevent headaches later on. Okay. So, so like I said, a lot of us finish uh, our computer science degree or IT, and we don't know where to go. We think it's just uh, developer. That's the only role, you know. Uh, come as you here. Unendo na chapa Cisco file. Uh, you get yourself into network, but there's a whole uh, op list of options available for all of us. So, as you can see, uh, there is quality engineering, obviously, is one of those options that we have. There is DevOps, um, there is backend, there is frontend, there is UI UX, okay, there is architecture. And architecture is also quite big. There's cloud, there's enterprise, there's solution, you know. Uh, so the list is endless. So what kind of skills do you need, technical skills to, to, to work as a QA? So what I'm trying to say is that QA is a highly skilled role that requires you to be a bit holistic. Um, unlike a developer, uh, who maybe a Java developer who is just focusing on Java only. QA, you have to be, because, if I tell you this, this thing is, is, is built from PHP. Do you tell me now because I've never touched PHP? I'm not going to assure this product. Of course, you can't tell me that. So, a QA has to be a bit more holistic. Um, you need a broad understanding of challenges of the coding practice, practices. You need to appreciate other things like even how to do deployment, uh, the environments, how to configure environments, how to ensure there's performance. Security, of course, is also a very important aspect of quality. Um, at Safaricom, we like talking about M-shaped or T-shaped employees. So T-shaped means you have breadth and some depth. depth. So there are those things that you appreciate, Juju. Um, and then there's that skill that you're very deeply rooted into. Uh, similar to M-shaped, you have a few depths and the horizontal that you can gloss over. So that if you find yourself in a room where people are talking about architecture, for instance, you're not green. You can contribute um, very uh, convincingly because you know what you're doing. You don't necessarily have to be very, very deep in it because that's not your role. Your role is to be quality engineer, uh, but you still have to have an appreciation of what these other roles, what they're doing. So you talk about uh, going live deployment. They tell you about a blue green. They 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 tell you about you know all those ty types of deployment. Eh? Um, tell you about Canary and all those types of deployment, at least you understand why um, and what they mean. Uh, cloud is quite big. Uh, a lot of deployments, uh, workloads uh, are nowadays on cloud. So you really have to get some appreciation again of cloud. Uh, things to do with logging, alert, monitoring. Because anyway, the first um, sign that there's a problem is that when you get an alert, eh, uh, most of the time, is uh, for those who are not very proactive enough, it's the customer complaining. But if you're proactive enough, then of course, the monitoring and the logs will tell you there's a problem. Then you can be proactively looking for solution before the customer starts escalating at your call center. Uh, so of course, cloud native is quite important because now that's how we build modern software. So virtualization, Docker, uh, containers, uh, Linux is quite important. Um, OWASP, that is security, uh, Babsuit. Um, I've talked about DevOps, so CI CD pipeline, uh, Git, um, monorepo, multi-repo, the types of deployments, um, Jenkins, all those you have to know. Um, API, you know, uh, you also have to understand protocols, JSON, REST, uh, um, tools, Cypress, um, Jemita. All this makes you a well-rounded T-shaped employee that is ready to not only just test, but also appreciate what goes on under the hood. So what are the type of testing that exist? Broadly, you can classify them as functional and non-functional. Uh, so non-functional, obviously, we just focus on um, things other than functionality. Okay, let me just start with functional. So functional, uh, about functionality of the software. If you have a... Uh, a website that does that is for e-commerce. Of course, functional uh, functionally, I would want to log in and do one or two, three. So those are functional aspects. Then non-functional is how does it perform? For instance, 
And when he does that performance, is it secure, for instance? How usable is it, you know? So there are different types of functional testing. You can talk about the unit testing, integration testing. I'm just saying on a very high level so that when you find your own time, you can check them out. You can check them out. And I will share this with uh, Malene or Samuel so that uh, you can always just uh, go through for those who are interested in this kind of area. So non function, of course, there's performance, um, there's security, there's usability, under performance, again, there is load testing, stress uh, testing, scalability yeah. testing, uh, volume testing, uh, spike yeah. testing. They quite, quite, quite a number. So in your own, in your own time, you can just find a chance to have a look at this type of testing and when are they used? When are they applicable? When are when are they uh, required? Um, again, this is just. Uh, a bit of a deep dive on functional testing, so unit testing. Unit testing mostly is done by a developer, but like I've said, a developer and a, de and a test engineer, of course, they have to work very closely together. Smoke testing, sanity, uh, integration. Uh, in your own free time, you can look at what they mean. Um, what do you mean by black box testing, white box testing? Uh, when do we need one and when do we need the other? Um, yeah. Still uh, a continuation of what, so a bit of tool uh, for those who are interested, and I want to believe a lot of us are going to be interested after this discussion, and I'm winding up. Um, you have a lot of open source, uh, source tools that are available for you to use. For those who are interested in doing UI or GUI tests, a bit mobile, um, a bit, uh, yeah, mostly web uh, or mobile app. So Selenium is one tool that you can use. You can use Selenium with Java, Selenium with Python, sometimes even Selenium with Groovy. Um, JMeter is an open source tool from Apache that we use for performance testing. Uh, Cypress is also a tool that we use for mostly web testing. Uh, Babsuit is for security, for those who are interested in that kind of uh, line. Um, yeah, so they are quite, quite a number uh, and you can check them out uh at your own free time so i want to leave it at that uh but i think the message i'm trying to pass here is that qa is quite broad qa is quite 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 interesting and um some of the trends that we are looking at right now in qa is that formation is key um so you really have to get your hands that you with, with, if you're already a developer that's quite okay because it's easier to convert a developer to a quality engineer as opposed to the other way around. So if you're already a developer and you want to explore this area, um, again, QA and DevOps uh, for us, especially at Safaricom, we consider it one global uh, chapter because they work together. Um, we look at it, the whole process, the moment a developer writes and commits the code um, on Git, you can configure it to start the whole pipeline, uh, say CD pipeline. So the whole build process, using whatever tools you use, uh, Gradle, Marvin, or whatever. Um, uh, testing and, you know, all the way to deployment. Uh, so it's a whole process that requires a developer, um, a quality engineer, and a DevOps engineer to work together to make sure that whatever we're releasing, we're releasing it quite fast and with the accuracy of quality and making sure that customer get, get it in time and for us to also get feedback. So that is it really, uh, Samuel, uh, Malin, uh, for me, unless there are questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jude, for that uh, informative session. I've, I've learned quite a lot about quality engineering and a bit of DevOps there. I think there's a question in the chat. Somebody's asking, are these tools language specific? Well, not necessarily. Um, okay, there are tools that are language specific. I know Selenium, you can use it with Python, you can use it with Java. Like I said, you can also use it with Groovy. Uh, JMeter is Apache. So mostly you need uh, to understand. Uh, Java will work for you um, best, but I think most of these open source tools are really not language uh, specific. Cypress will work best for JavaScript uh, applications, but anyway, we know 
ninety percent of the web is is JavaScript. So Selenium again can also work with JavaScript. So mm-hmm. I don't think language is really an emphasis here. We try to make sure that we are as language agnostic as possible, and also that's the advocacy I'm pushing out there. So if you are finding yourself getting started in any of this, don't really focus on the tool or on the language, focus on the concept, and then you can take that language of your choice uh, to apply your concept. So it really doesn't matter which, which language you are competing. Okay, um, there's another question. Somebody is asking, what are some of the open source quality assurance or quality engineering projects, if any, that they can contribute to in order to gain hands-on experience in testing and quality engineering holistically? Oh, wow. Well. Uh, I think this is this is a good this is a good question. Um, sometimes I also struggle with uh, with this kind of question because uh, even at Paricom we try to push people to contribute to open source. But then the question you ask yourself, okay, what are some of the open source projects out there that we can actually uh, contribute to? So I would say um, I don't have a, a definite answer, but I would say just go online search open source uh, projects for QA. Uh, one you can do. Uh, I know at Safaricom we took a uh, robot framework, which is, which is an open source tool, and we are trying to customize it to our own liking because we have unique use cases. So that is us contributing. Maybe one day when, once we are done with it, we can push it back uh, for people to, you can do a match request or something like that, go, to go to a review, and if they accept it as something of additional quality for them, uh, the community will accept it. So I think you can just do a quick search online. Um, Jemita uh, has a lot of support community. You can be part of that community. Uh, ask questions, ask how you can contribute. Maybe there's something they're struggling with. Maybe uh, you can help research. Uh, so I really don't have a definite answer, but I think just a quick search on the internet will give you the direction. Okay. I hope that answers your question. Barongo, uh, there's another question. Somebody is saying, I know automation is utilized to perform repetitive tasks, but what are some areas where automation is not required? Yeah, I think this is, this is another good question. Uh, we say automation is quite good, but not all use cases require automation. Uh, how do you automate usability, for instance? Okay. You cannot uh, automate that. Like, um, how do you automate how you the look and feel of our website. I say, somebody say, a customer say, I don't like the green button, I like it red. You cannot automate that. That you just have to look at yourself because it's an opinion based sort of. Um, there are also other cases where automation would be possible, but you ask yourself, is it worth uh, wasting my time on if you have other pressing issues, for instance. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, you have uh, a project that is just one of, you know, you did today, you will not do it again, perhaps in next to the, uh, for the next three years. So why, because automation will require you some time. So why waste your time doing automa- automation on this project when you could spend uh, time doing other projects that, because the reason why we do automation is so that in the next, when you're, in the next iteration, if there's a regression to be done, you don't have to do it manually. But if you have one of projects that will not come back for any regression or anything like that, those are also scenarios where automation may not be ideal. If you want to do it, fine, but we may not, we will not kill you if you don't. Uh, I hope that answered your question, Rox. Uh, is there anyone else with a question? If you wish, you can unmute and maybe ask it, or you can just write it in the chat. Otherwise, for those who will not be able to ask their questions today, maybe Jude, you can share your social media links and somebody can reach out personally in case they have something else to ask you. Uh, my social media links, if you do a quick search on Jude Juma, you'll find me all over the, the media. <laughs> Maybe no, I don't know. Uh, you'll find me on LinkedIn, Jude Juma. I think that's the most relevant anyway here. Yeah. So uh, Jude Juma is okay. You'll find me on LinkedIn. Okay. Thank you so much. We have uh, learned quite a lot from this session and I'm sure somebody has gotten an inspiration to Kamuchu's hand is up. Kamuchu? Yeah, Jude. Jude. Yes. Um, yes, I, I have a quick one. I was wondering in terms of the, because sometimes you hear 
um, guys talking about at least unit testing. We as the developers, we can incorporate it within, within our code. Uh, then there are those integration tests. Yes. Um, and uh, so I, I, sometimes I wonder what, from your own experience, which parts are you guys able to automate uh, so that it happens um, automatically? Uh, do you have, do you do UATs? Because I know I'm coming from a context where we used to do UATs and UATs was a, or user acceptance tests. Yes. And they used to take a lot of time. And of course they were manual. Um, yeah. But maybe I, I just wanted to get a picture of how uh, things look like from your end in terms of the automation of those testing. Does Selenium get rid of the users? Like, you know, those web, uh, the yeah. various interactions that the users take from your own, is it, is it something that people talk on, on paper or does it actually happen? Or what are yeah. the challenges? What's the balance? I just wanted to get a picture of the reality as, as, yeah. as it is. Yeah. Yeah. So Samuel, I think that's a great question. And uh, it's also something that even, even me personally, uh, I have had to reflect on because the way we, sometimes we do UAT is because UAT is supposed to be, like you say, user acceptance test. So it's the user who has to test and accept, you know, and sign off and say, uh, as the user, which is most, which in most cases is the business guy who, who, who owns that system, say, I have tested and I think I'm, I'm okay with it so we can go live. Ideally, UAT is supposed to be just a checklist, a very small scope of testing. So because a user will know Okay, these are my requirements. Uh, I want this 10. If this 10 are working, then I'm good to go. You understand? But most of the time, you'll find uh, UAT, and the way we do it most of the time is that because it's being done by a user, it's not uh, automated. What we try to automate uh, is the regression testing. Because regression testing is what you do over and over. If you have, uh, say, uh, something on Impressor, and uh, there is a new release, maybe the app, there's a new release right now. Um, you, do, you do the testing and you know for sure in the next two weeks, there's going to be another new release that will require us to test the whole thing. So if you go the manual way, of course, you're going to find yourself in trouble. So for regression testing, and this we do uh, after maybe there has been a change on software, we try to emphasize on automation. We create a, an automation suite that then... Uh, get maintained every two weeks when, whenever a new feature is added. And it makes sense because this is something that you'll be doing over and over and over again. Uh, so to avoid those, those pains that we sometimes experience, uh, we do uh, automation. For, for such kind of a project, UAT will focus on just a very small scope. So like I said, if you are doing the app, and the app, when they're doing UAT, they're just doing UAT for a very small scope. So the owners will just do a, a small checklist. This is working. But once it's pushed live, okay, it will be the responsibility of the QA or whoever in charge to make sure that that push has not impacted the what was already working. So to make sure that is done, you do a regression test. And regression would mean the scope for the UAT and also the scope for the entire app. And that you can't not you cannot do you cannot do uh, using manual testing. So you define most deployment nights after your tiers passed and the users even you go ahead, you do the deployment. Uh, on the night of deployment, you have to go, do what's called post-check sort of. Uh, so post-deployment testing. And that's where regression comes in. And that requires you to do the entire scope of the new feature plus whatever was existing. So ideally, that's how it should be. Um, but whatever we normally call UAT, sometimes uh, you ask yourself and you're like, this is not UAT. This is like a whole scope of testing we're doing. But the best practice is to have UAT as just a very small checklist that a user himself or herself can just quickly check, validate against whatever requirements they are provided uh, to be confident that this is able to follow. But anyway, the direction we are going, uh, Sam, just to extend this question of yours, um, is so that we have an automated uh, pipeline. Like I said, the moment a code is committed on Git, uh, the entire process of uh, DevOps ACD pipeline should kick, kick in. And 
the kind of maturity we are looking for, even for us at Safari Com, is to also make sure that not just the functional test, but even the non-functional uh, test, so that when we are very sure that this software is stable enough to to go through a performance test, and mostly we encourage performance tests whenever there's a new service that could perhaps um, impact the response time, the load time, you know, and all those kind of performance issues. So the kind of maturity we're looking for is to have that kind of pipeline and that can allow you to even do a test, rather do a deployment during the day. Because you ask yourself, fine, uh, at Safaricom we normally do deployments at night. But if you are going global and you're probably becoming a, a big global company, what is night time? Because what is night for us may not be night for someone in China. If you are saying <coughs> Empresa, Empresa Globe, okay? If you're doing an, a deployment on Empresa, and Empresa is going to be used by everybody uh, throughout the how many countries. So what is night for us may not be night for some other people. So we have to get to the point where we're able to do tests with all the accuracy and with all the, without having to, you know, fear the kind of problems we can face in a final meaning environment is not ready. So the reason why sometimes we do deployments at night is because we are trying to uh, make sure if there's an impact, it's not as big as if it was done during the day. But anyway, it's a discussion that uh, we are having and it's the kind of maturity we are aiming at that we are able to do all these releases very automatically and you can do it anytime of the day within the 24 hours. So you don't have to wait until there is no traffic. Uh, yeah, I don't know whether I have answered your question. Your question. Kamucho, I hope your question was answered. Somebody is asking, um, Simon Oshira is asking, that does the unit engineers work closely with the, the development team at Safaricom? So, so he's asking the setup. How does that work in at Safaricom? Okay, for Safaricom, we we have agile ways of working. So we and we use Scrum as our agile methodology. So for Scrum, you'd find uh, we have developer team that includes backend, so, uh, front end, uh, SDEP, which we call software developer and test or quality engineer. So we all call them developers. So they have to work together. And then we have product owners and, and um, agile coach. The rest are all developers. Uh, so that's how they are created and they are put in a small unit called a, a squad that is uh, autonomous, um, that is self-reliant, and they can make decisions on the fly about the product without really having to go through the bureaucratic processes of approval and whatnot. So the whole point is for them to work very closely together, consult when need be, and take ownership together of the product. So QA, uh, Dev, uh, they have to, in fact, sometimes in some cases you find uh, the developer helping the QA to write uh, the test, the automation script. And sometimes you find the QA helping the developer to write the unit uh, testing script and vice versa. So the whole point is to encourage them to as collaborate as much as possible and work together. That is the kind of setup we have at Safaricom. And that's the kind of setup that I think is um, advocated for by the people who advocate for other ways of work. Oh, thank you. I hope your question was answered, Simon. Um, Ranga is asking, what are the initial stages of becoming a quality engineer or a quality assurance engineer? I think it's the same as being a developer. I think uh, the most important thing is to, first of all, appreciate what um, what quality engineers do. Um, and then number two, uh, get to learn uh, scripting, get to learn uh, automation. I've mentioned quite a lot about even the tools, Selenium, a robot framework, a Cypress, performance testing with, with JMeter. Uh, you can also learn the concept of quality. Uh, I've, I've typed it on the chat. Um, yeah, so I think I think that will give you the foundation. But most importantly, just like any other thing, I think you just need to find yourself doing a deep dive. Um, get uh, somebody who does QA, maybe uh, ask them as many questions as possible, offer to also help them do what they do. Uh, you can only learn better on the job. Uh, so Zaki is asking, we had another engineer last week take us through a DevOps, DevSecOps masterclass. His name was uh, Peter Kiptani. So Zaki is asking, 
uh, is seeing that Peter Kiptani spoke on uh, the today's development processes, abandoning waterfall and going the CICAD approach. And today you have mentioned that uh, you guys do agile methodology. So Zaki is a bit confused as to where is it CICD or is it agile that is used? You say if you could explain that. Okay, okay, I get it. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I think, uh, I think, I think that Zaki, um, it's a good question, uh, and the whole point we are trying to, to to push here is that anyway we are we are agile as a company, and a lot of companies are agile. So agile is is a it's a mindset sort of, is a way of working. So CICD and agile uh, is not either or. So you'd find CICD is one of those processes that we do to facilitate agile ways of working. So CICD meaning continuous integration, continuous deployment. Um, the, re the reason why you do continuous integration and continuous deployment and even continuous testing is so that you can release that product very fast. Get feedback, build another one, release very fast, get feedback, build another one. So that takes you back to agile ways of working. That's what agile really advocates for. Agile means fast, nimble, you know, getting feedback from customers. So they're really not uh, different sides. Uh, they're the same. I mean, CCD is just one way of achieving agile, okay? Uh, DevOps, CCD is, 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 a, is a DevOps practice, okay? So you, 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 you should not really get confused. Um, agile is a, a way of working, just like waterfall is a way of working. Um, so CICD is one of those things, processes that we have developed to promote agile, okay? The same way you can say DevOps. DevOps is also a way of working um, where you bring developers and the ops side working together. Uh, if you had sometimes, I think the biggest pain point people used to face is that developer, they do their own things. Uh, give my friends, they develop their crap and then they let the ops guy to deal with the challenges that come out of it. So through DevOps, uh, we try to make sure that when you develop it, if it's crap, you have to support it or you support your crap. We call dog booting, okay? You develop something nice, you support it. Of course, you're not going to go through the pain of dealing with customers. So DevOps is trying to bridge that gap between a developer and the people, the people who do the ops, the people who do the deployment, are configuring infra and making sure that uh, there's monitoring and whatnot. So to bridge that gap and make sure that people are working together, DevOps was created as a way of working. So really, uh, if we look, look at it holistically, CCD, uh, Agile, and DevOps, they are more or less the same concept, one aiding the other. Yeah, so should not, should really not confuse them. Uh, I hope that answered your question, Zaki. Uh, is there anyone else with a question for Jude? Okay. So he has uh, said his socials, especially LinkedIn, is Jujuma. You can find him on LinkedIn. Uh, thank you so much for that session, especially at a time when uh, software development or coding is being uh, hyped a lot on social media it is good to know that there are other people in the field who are doing other things apart from coding and they are willing to guide those who are just getting in on this side paths so that they don't have to feel like they have to get into coding if that is not really their area of interest it has been a pleasure having you and i have personally learned a lot from you and we hope to have you next time if you will be willing to host another session with us. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, it's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sam, for this opportunity. I think it's an ongoing discussion, so feel free to always engage me. Um, perhaps maybe in the next session, we have a deep dive on the practical aspects of the things I've talked about. You can do a quick automation scenario, quick performance test scenario. Um, I know Peter also talked so much about uh, DevOps. Uh, maybe you will get a chance to help you know how you can configure all this Jenkins so that you see it's really happening in real life. Uh, but I think it's really nice. Um, and maybe also um, uh, a disclaimer. Uh, QA is not for people who fear coding. So because if you come to QA, you still find you're writing a lot of coding scripts. So it's a myth you really have to debunk. Um, all we are saying is that um, perhaps QA is not 
about creating products, it's about making sure that this product is working the way it's supposed to work. So you can do this manually or you can do this using automation. Automation would mean you're writing script and that is coding. So yeah, uh, but anyway, if you still fear coding, there's always a place for you. Uh, there's, there's a whole spectrum of activities you can find yourself doing within the SDRC. Um, even if you find yourself as a business analyst, you still have to do some, understand some code, do POC, you know. So, and you should really not, not fear. If you just get a good mentor, you find these people who do these things, they're not geniuses. Huh? They're not Elon Musk. <laughs> Anybody can do anything. All you need is a good attitude, uh, dedicate some time for it, and a good mentor to get you started. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. So guys, you have heard, if you have any questions for Jude, you can find him on his social platform, LinkedIn, and maybe he can uh, tell you more on a personal level. Otherwise, we will be sure to invite you next time so that we can have a practical session on Jenkins and maybe do a deep dive on the approaches that you have talked about.